so today we are going to talk on management of goldstone disease uh, uh, the little delay was due to sort of some technical uh, problems uh, <coughs> now uh, this is a common disease goldstones uh, and uh, <coughs> goldstones occur in about 10 to 20 percent of the population and uh, in fact uh, the we don't have real data about uh, the incidence of goldstone in our country but in western countries uh, the incidence is around 10 to 20 percent and uh, it is little less in asia and uh, goldstones are common among females and uh, the prevalence increases with advancing age it's roughly around uh, uh, <coughs> at the age of 60 about the 30 percent of the people are harboring gold stones and it further increases uh, when you are living for about 80 years and uh, majority <coughs> about 85 percent of the gold stones they are asymptomatic they don't cause any problems uh, during your life uh, and uh, you live with gold stones and you die with gold stones you don't die of gold stones uh, so in most people it is a benign condition but in about less than 15 percent uh, gold stones tend to cause problems and uh, as you may already learned in your uh, faculty days uh, the most of the gold stones are predominantly cholesterol stones and uh, the rest is uh, predominantly pigment stones or bile stones. Uh, cholesterol stones are large and they are green or yellow and uh, <coughs> faceted stones and pigment stones are usually small stones uh, and uh, they are dark brown or black in color. Uh, having said that, uh, the majority of the stones are mixed stones. Uh, so they are they are raw cholesterol as well as sort of bile stones. But the predominant component in the majority of the stones are cholesterol. Uh, so you may think the hyperlipidemia may associate with uh, gold stones. Uh, there is no direct relationship uh, with gold uh, stones and the hyperlipidemia. But uh, several studies have shown patients with uh, high cholesterol level are associated with a uh, higher incidence of gold stones. And the risk factors for gold stones are also more or less similar. Uh, obesity, uh, which is sort of common uh, for hyperlipidemia as well as uh, gold stones. And uh, the formation of gold stones and uh, formation of gold stone is a very complex story, but make it very uh, simple. Uh, the the requirements for form to form gold stones is the hypersaturation of cholesterol in the bile or uh, bilirubin. <coughs> the majority it is the cholesterol. So this hypersaturation of cholesterol uh, per se doesn't cause stones because uh, the, the other components in the bile uh, try to sort of keep it in uh, uh, soluble form. But when there is a uh, dysfunction in the motility of the gallbladder wall, as well as the sphincter complex, sphincter uh, bile tend to stay, bile stasis occurs, and this will lead to stone formation. And uh, the minority, it is the increased bilirubin uh, in patients like hemolytic disease, liver disease, that also forms uh, uh, instead of cholesterol, predominant stones, they form uh, pigment stones. Uh, but so the hypersaturation is important as well as uh, dysfunction of gallbladder ball and sphincter is also important uh, for the formation of these stones. And uh, <clears throat> when you take stones, most of these stones occur in the gallbladder. More than 90% of the stones 
are primary gold bladder stones. Very rarely you get stones in the duct system uh, without having stones in the gold bladder. And most of the stones you come across in the uh, biliary tree, common bile duct, are also originally originated in the gall bladder and passed into the duct system. So primary duct uh, stones are not that common. It also indicate that a culprit is the gall bladder <coughs> for the formation of uh, gall stones. So uh, in addition to the supersaturation, gall bladder dysfunction and the sphincter uh, dysfunction is responsible for uh, formation of gold stones in the majority. So that is why cholecystectomy is the treatment uh, for the symptomatic gold stone disease. Otherwise, if we just open the gold bladder and take the gold stone out, would have been the treatment, uh, which was tried more than 100 years ago and uh, proved to be ineffective in controlling stones because as long as the culprit or the gallbladder is there, it forms more and more stones and it's an endless story. So it is not the cholecystostomy and removal of the stone, but cholecystectomy is the treatment of uh, uh, a treatment uh, for symptomatic gold stone disease. So <clears throat> what are the symptoms of the gold stones? As I said, good majority do not have symptoms. More than 85% of the patients remain asymptomatic during their life, even with gold stones. But a minority do get gold stones. And uh, a group of symptoms are due to stones in the gallbladder. And another group of symptoms are stones in the uh, biliary duct system. And the commonest symptom due to gold stones is biliary colic. Biliary colic, uh, in fact, is a misnomer because uh, you rarely appreciate a colicky pain uh, in biliary colic. Uh, this is due to a uh, stone in the gallbladder, and uh, this stone causes outflow obstruction, and gallbladder is trying to expel it out. So, you initially, when there is an obstruction to the outflow, the gallbladder tends to uh, distend. Gallbladder doesn't have much of uh, muscle uh, in relation to the uh, luminal volume of the gallbladder. So uh, it doesn't have sort of contraction like in ureter or uterus where you really appreciate the colicky nature of the uh, colicky pain. But here you get more vague uh, contracting type of pain or crampy type of pain uh, in the upper abdomen. Another thing is gallbladder is embryologically originated in the mid as a midline structure. So this pain you felt in the epigastric region. Later it is situated in the right upper quadrant, so in the right upper quadrant. It may, you may feel gallbladder pain uh, in the left upper quadrant as well because of its embryological origin. And this colicky pain, or so-called colicky or crampy pain, uh, very dull, aching uh, pain, may radiate to the back, but a common misnomer is sort of it is radiant to the tip of the shoulder, which is an unlikely event. And, but it do radiate to back, probably, uh, uh, to the scapular region, but uh, doesn't radiate to the tip of the shoulder. Other nature of this pain is sort of the duration of pain is very variable. It may last few minutes to few hours. But if pain persists more than six hours, we don't call it biliary colics. The chances of being having uh, inflammation going on in the gallbladder due to outflow obstruction is very likely if the pain persists more than six hours. That condition, biliary colic is an uninflammatory condition. It is due to obstruction. So you don't get the symptoms due to systemic inflammation or due to local inflammation. 
they don't have fever, they don't have tachycardia unless the pain causes a bit of tachycardia. Uh, they may have little bit of uh, uh, nausea, vomiting due to autonomic uh, uh, hyperactivation, but they don't have Murphy's sign. Uh, their uh, blood chemistry, the inflammatory markers, full blood count and C-reactive protein are known. Their liver functions are hardly deranged. Uh, so biliary colic is basically a clinical diagnosis and it is proven, proved by radiologically presence of gold stones in the gallbladder. If pain persists more than six hours, with the evidence of uh, 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 evidence of inflammation clinically as in Murphy's sign, tachycardia, fever, or power chemically like raised white count and a CRP, then we call it acute cholecystitis. Initially, acute cholecystitis is a chemical inflammation, but later on it will be a bacterial infection. And acute cholecystitis, the patient is more unwell and uh, needs hospital admission. You can get uh, outflow obstruction without infection or inflammation because the mucosal of the gallbladder. There are the outflow tract is obstructed. The gallbladder uh, is filled with bile as well as the mucus secreted by the uh, gallbladder wall. So <coughs> this bile is white. So you call it white. When, when, when you open a mucosal, it is not a bile color because of mainly it consists of the mucus secreted by the uh, uh, gallbladder wall. If a mucosal get infected, we call it empyema of the gallbladder, which is uh, not very common, but common among sort of immunocompromised and diabetic patients. Empyema of the gallbladder is like an abscess elsewhere. They have high fever pain, continuous pain, raised inflammatory markers, it looks unwell as well, and the radiology is diagnostic. As you know, the gallbladder is supplied by cystic artery, which is uh, end artery in about 50% of the cases. Most of the stones causing problems in the Hartman pouch, and uh, when there's an inflammation, the thrombosis of the gallbladder, gall uh, cystic artery is a consequence may lead to gangrenous gallbladder, more commonly seen among diabetic patients as well as vascular pets, and uh, not a very common complication among other patients. And uh, this may lead to perforation, peritonitis, if not treated early, end up in death. So uh, biliary colic is the commonest and the most common uh, symptomatic gallstone disease, next is acute cholecystitis, and mucosal empyema, gangrene, and perforation occur in immunocompromised diabetics and vascular pads, uh, which are not very common, uh, and patients present with symptoms much earlier, either with biliary colics or acute cholecystitis, uh, when they have uh, uh, problematic stones in the gallbladder. You get another set of problems, especially when stones in the biliary duct system, common bile duct, or the transient passage of stones along the biliary duct system. This is acute pancreatitis, obstructive jaundice if it sort of stay in the uh, duct system, and cholangitis, is the superadded infection when there is an obstruction in the duct system. Acute pancreatitis, usually it is a mild disease, but in about 10% of the patients, it is severe acute pancreatitis, which needs a more uh, high dependency care and may end up in mortality as well. Obstructive jaundice per se is not a very serious condition, but needs definite uh, intervention, uh, but uh, superadded infection in an obstructive patient, uh, obstructed drone this patient that is called cholangitis uh, is a very serious condition. 
and uh, associate with the uh, significant mortality as well as morbidity needs early intervention. And uh, in addition to these uh, two groups of uh, symptomatic goldstone disease, uh, extremely rarely we see uh, conditions like uh, myrisis syndrome, uh, which is due to extrinsic compression of uh, common hepatic duct usually from the impacted stone, uh, usually in the infundibulum of the gallbladder or in the cystic duct as well. Uh, it is not so common, uh, but this may lead to even cholangitis as well. Goldstone ileus is uh, still uh, very, very rare. I'm yet to see a patient with goldstone ileus uh, uh, during my clinical career. Uh, and uh, this is due to impacted stone in the small bowel and uh, causing bowel obstruction. And this stone escaped into the small bowel uh, due to uh, cholecystoenteric fistula, either into the duodenum or into a small bowel and uh, it causes a large stone causing uh, small bowel obstruction. We are not going to talk much about Mirisi and Goldstone ileus, but the rest of the discussion is mainly on the common problems due to Goldstones. So as I said, uh, symptomatic Goldstones represent only about minority, 15% of the patient. And uh, the <coughs> and they need some treatment. Why? Because it does affect their day-to-day -day life and quality of life. Then uh, it may progress into more serious complications like acute cholecystitis, uh, empyme of the gallbladder, gangrene gall gangrenous gallbladder, perforation, or oh, the stones may escape into the bile duct system and causing obstructive jaundice, pancreatitis, or cholangitis. So because of this main risk, the symptomatic cold stone disease patients, honey, we offer surgery. In addition to the uh, symptoms leading to repeated uh, hospital admission and poor quality of life and uh, complications. Rarely, goldstones, uh, we have a concern of goldstone causing gallbladder cancer, but it is extremely rare and overall incidence is less than 1%. So, usually we don't offer because it can cause cancer, but we offer either it is symptomatic, poor quality of life, and the risk of complications. Patient who develop even biliary colic has a higher risk of developing other complications. And today, the laparoscopic cholecystectomy remains the primary procedure of choice or gold standard procedure for symptomatic goldstone disease. It is fairly safe procedure associated with mortality of less than 0.1% and overall morbidity of less than 0.5%. And bile duct injury to date is between 0.1 to 0.3 percent and 92 percent of the patients remain free of symptoms after uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Before offering uh, uh, cholecystectomy for patients with symptomatic goldstone disease, it is important to assess these patients, their history and examination. Main objective of uh, your history examination and investigating a patient with symptomatic cold stone disease is to confirm your diagnosis. There are many other conditions may mimic uh, cold stone disease, dyspeptic symptoms, gastritis, uh, even myocardial infarction, diverticulitis, pancreatitis. So it is important to assess, uh, uh, take a good history and examine these patients. In the history and examination, the duration and type of the pain is very informative. Presence of fever, vomiting, and evidence of biliary obstructions like uh, dark stool, pale, uh, sorry, pale stools, dark urine, and jaundice. Uh, 
and level of hydration, abdominal signs, especially the Murphy's signs and the palpable cold bladder are <coughs> uh, things to be uh, pay attention. And uh, when you consider investigations, uh, almost all these patients uh, needs ultrasound scan of the abdomen. This may confirm uh, the presence of stones in the uh, gallbladder. And the liver profile is done uh, to assess any evidence, biochemical evidence of stones in the biliary tree. It is not very specific uh, and uh, sensitive either but uh, pooling of these results with the history examination and the radiological assessment uh, gives us uh, more valuable information. Presence of uh, elevated direct bilirubin alkaline phosphatase is uh, suggestive of uh, presence of duct stones and uh, raised inflammatory markers uh, in full blood count and CRP uh, uh, will help us to uh, diagnose cholecystitis or other inflammatory uh, complications of goldstone disease. As I said, the main objective of this investigation are to confirm diagnosis, recognize the presence of complications and the status of the bile ducts. That's the presence of stones uh, or obstruction due to any other reasons in the bile duct. This is very important because when there is gallbladder, when there, when there is an obstruction in the biliary tree, in the presence of a gallbladder, the gallbladder takes the brunt of the pressure. So the intraductal pressure doesn't go up uh, when, the, when the gallbladder is intact. When you remove the gallbladder, the intraductal pressure rapidly goes up. And uh, if you don't detect stones or obstruction in the duct system before removing the gallbladder. The stump blowout and the other complications are very high. So it is very important to make sure that the duct system is free of stones or obstruction due to any other reasons before removing the gallbladder. Our clinical assessment, radiological assessment with ultrasound, uh, liver profile, these three, biochemical assessment with liver profile, these three will uh, help us to recognize uh, absence of stones or obstruction in the bile duct to less than 4%. That means sort of if your history just doesn't suggestive of uh, stone in the uh, duct system like no dark urine, no pale stools uh, and uh, uh, no jaundice and uh, biochemistry there is no raised uh, bilirub direct bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase is less than three times the normal values and ultrasound doesn't show any evidence of dilated uh, bile ducts or cystic duct. Uh, other thing which I forgot to tell in the history is sort of evidence of pancreatitis. So in these patients if history is negative, biochemistry, the liver profile negative and the radiologically ultrasound if it is negative if these three components are negative the chances of having a stone in the common bile duct is less than four uh, percent so 94 percent or 95 percent of the time uh, you don't get into a problem if you have these studies uh, in within normal range but <coughs> uh, uh, if, if there is any evidence of uh, uh, abnormal findings in the biochemistry or radiology or in the history, uh, we prefer to do other investigations like uh, CT scan, MRCP, endoscopic ultrasound or ERCP. ERCP is invasive investigations. The, uh, the place for ERCP is very low down nowadays. Uh, in the availability of CT, MRCP and endoscopic ultrasound. So these investigations are not being done routinely, but if there is any evidence or sus suspicion of having uh, bile duct stone uh, or obstruction in the duct system, we prefer to do these investigations. 
So mandatory, commonly done investigations are ultrasound scan, liver function, full blood count, and CRP, that is more than enough. But other investigations, when there is a specific indication. So uh, as I said, uh, the gold standard treatment for symptomatic goldstone is uh, cholecystectomy. And, uh, and that accounts only for about minority, <laughs> less than 15%. So good majority of patients are having stones, but they are asymptomatic. So what are we going to do for them? These asymptomatic gold stones are detected more and more nowadays because we do routine ultrasound for any abdominal pain, discomfort. Or even if they don't have abdominal symptoms, we do ultrasound as routine uh, medical checkups. So we do detect gold stones because if you get down uh, <coughs> females around 60 years and do ultrasound, 30 to 40 percent will harbor gold stones, even if they don't have any symptom. Should all need cholecystectomy. Uh, 100 years ago, in, or more than 100 years ago, 1904, William J. Mayor, he said sort of there is no innocent gold stones, but after 100 years, right? Very few people believe this, <laughs> but we have convincing evidence that majority, that means more than 85% of the stones are innocent. They don't do any harm. They live with you and you will die of something else, but not die of the gold stones. So this is not a valid statement nowadays uh, at any context. Uh, so we don't believe uh, as William Mayer believed, uh, there is no uh, innocent gold stones. What we believe today is sort of majority of the gold stones are innocent until proved otherwise. So majority can be uh, managed without surgery, and we don't don't have to do regular ultrasound scans to see whether the gold stones are going to disappear or not. It will never disappear. They will stay with you till you die. So ultrasound follow-up is also not important. And uh, uh, so expectant management is the policy nowadays for majority of the asymptomatic gold stones. This is based on natural history of the uh, asymptomatic gold stones. And uh, the risk of surgery uh, are more than the complications uh, when we, we discover in the natural history of uh, gold stone disease. So uh, consensus are to manage innocent gold, uh, asymptomatic gold stones uh, conservatively. What is the natural history of gold stone disease? Now, the natural history of gold stone disease vary in different parts of the world. So there is a ge geographical and ethnic variations of uh, the natural history of the gold stones. But overall, the concepts and the uh, uh, guidelines are based on uh, these things. We don't have our uh, own data, but still uh, it is comparable. Annual complication rate of initially asymptomatic uh, patients with gold stone disease is less than 0.3%. That is the chances of them getting a symptom. Uh, in a year, uh, in a patient who is having a gold stone disease, if you take 1,000 patients, only three of them will develop symptoms. And even though they develop symptoms, usually they are milder symptoms like biliary colics initially. And longer they remain asymptomatic, now the chances of them developing symptoms are more in the first 10 years, in the younger age. But after 10 years, the chances of developing symptoms are still less. So longer they remain asymptomatic, less likely they uh, develop symptoms. Some people misuse this uh, concept to do cholecystectomy when they detect stones in the younger age, right? Telling that sort of there is a uh, chance of developing symptoms, adding uh, one to two percent annually, right? But Till it is very, very low. And majority, 
rarely develop severe symptoms or life-threatening symptoms like cholangitis, pancreatitis, without at least one episode of biliary pain. So you may jolly well wait and do the surgery if they do develop uh, biliary symptoms. And very unlikely they will present with the first symptom of uh, severe pancreatitis or cholangitis. And absolute risk of gallbladder carcinoma in the general population is very much less than 1%. So we don't have to sort of do this procedure uh, because of the fear of uh, gallbladder carcinoma. Either. So uh, because of these uh, uh, evidence, we don't offer cholecystectomy for asymptomatic goldstone disease. Uh, Gallbladder carcinoma, if we take, we do when we were medical students, uh, we said sort of one risk factor for gallbladder carcinoma is gold stones, but the risk is very low. And it has a wide geographical and ethnic variation. Luckily, we are not belong to that ethnic group or in a geographical belt. See, our country is uh, not in that geographical belt. There are parts in the northern India, Pakistan, uh, Peru, where there is a higher incidence of uh, gallbladder carcinoma uh, among patients having goldstone disease. So we don't have to offer cholecystectomy uh, with the fear of uh, gallbladder carcinoma. And increased incidence of gallbladder carcinoma is associated with uh, uh, calcified gallbladder, called porcelain gallbladder, large stones more than three centimeters and when there are gold stones associated with polyps more than one centimeter. So these three types of patients, if you do detect sort of calcified gallbladder or porcelain gallbladder or polyp more than gallbladder polyp with a stone and a, a large stone more than three centimeters, it is fair enough to sort of offer cholecystectomy uh, even if they are asymptomatic, but not otherwise. Having said that, there are a few relative indications for cholecystectomy for asymptomatic goldstone disease. I, I would like to emphasize again the good majority, uh, more than 80%, do not need cholecystectomy if they are asymptomatic. And, uh, uh, and a few indications uh, they are still uh, they are uh, debatable and they are only considered as only relative indication but not absolute indications. One is chronic hemolytic disease where they tend to form more and more stones and if they are if you are planning a procedure for the hemolytic disease like splenectomy during that procedure if he has got asymptomatic stones in the gallbladder uh, you may do cholecystectomy. And the transplant recipient, this is also highly debatable uh, because uh, uh, these patients after transplant are on immunosuppressive drugs. So the complications of the gallstone uh, disease, they may not present in early stages, they may develop serious complications. And immunosuppressive drugs per se, some drugs are lithogenic. Because of these theoretical reasons, some do suggest uh, prophylactic cholecystectomy uh, for the transplant recipient. But there is no adequate data to support this. Uh, but the, these arguments have a fair, uh, 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 the reasonable argument. Then the poorly controlled diabetes, there are also the chances of uh, severe complications or the outcome of severe complications are significantly high, like gallbladder perforation, gangrene, and even if they do develop empyema perforation, the mortality is very high. So uh, there is uh, some group of uh, Surgeons do suggest poor uh, cholecystectomy for poor uh, controlled diabetes with asymptomatic goldstones, but uh, 
there is no uh, level one evidence to support this presence of cbd stones we, do, we all agree that they need so uh, presence of cbd stone uh, of course most of these stones uh, arise from originate from the gallbladder so uh, there is uh, not much of argument in this and uh, ma majority agrees that they need uh, cholecystectomy uh, while addressing the stone in the uh, common bile duct as well when you do a uh, cholecystectomy for patients who are having cbd stones either you remove the cbd stones or clear off biliary duct system before cholecystectomy or you do both procedures at the same time uh, cirrhosis again the same argument as in diabetes and immunocompromised uh, patients their outcome in complicated goldstone disease is uh, high but there is no increased incidence of developing complicated goldstone disease in them also uh, high risk of developing gallbladder carcinoma this is applicable in certain geographical areas and ethnic groups of course in those patients large goldstones of they offer uh, cholecystectomy and uh, other thing is uh, good old days we used to do appendicectomy if you do laparotomy uh, likewise uh, whether to do cholecystectomy in all laparotomies uh, in patients who are harboring asymptomatic gold stones answer is no but the procedures like weight reduction procedures like bariatric surgery sleeve gastrectomy mini gastric bypass these patients during the weight reduction phase they tend to develop there is increased incidence of gold stone formation as well as gold stone related complications so there is a valid argument to do uh, cholecystectomy for these patients again the same for fundoplication as well so uh, there are absolute indication is symptomatic patients with uh, gold stones and there are few relative indications for asymptomatic patients with gold stones risk of malignancy is a very very remote indication for cholecystectomy in asymptomatic gold stone disease and majority of the asymptomatic gold stone disease can be managed expectantly so the availability of the laparoscopic cholecystectomy should not expand the indication for gallbladder removal for asymptomatic gold stones there is no argument that we have a nice tool it doesn't cause much of scars uh, problems post operative recovery is very good so might as well take your gallbladder out if when if there are gold stones like uh, without sort of uh, waiting until they develop uh, symptoms this argument doesn't have any valid basis and should not be practiced at uh, any cost uh so think i have uh, uh uh briefed uh, the common uh, situations due to or the main uh, concepts of the management of gold stone disease but there are rare clinical uh, scenarios uh, or situations uh, where you come across these are not very common like uh, I, I thought I'd just brush up uh, or just touch these uh, areas also. Acalculus cholecystitis, where you can get inflammation of gallbladder uh, without having stones, right? Uh, no stones radiologically. CT also doesn't show any evidence of gold stones, but they have uh, positive Murphy's, evidence of inflammation, pain, tenderness. and. This is uh, common in old age as well as young children. Uh, definitive treatment is surgery, but most of the time in old age, uh, these patients are not fit for surgery. So most of these patients, if they are not fit for surgery, uh, should be managed conservatively with uh, biliary drainage, ultrasound guided external biliary drainage, or with antibiotics. Then uh, management of gold stones in pregnancy, highly controversial. Uh, 
during pregnancy they tend to develop problems of uh, complications of cold stones uh, uh, is little higher uh, during pregnancy because of the motility of the gallbladder is less during pregnancy uh, so uh, they tend to uh, get problems or symptoms due to gold stones even they even the patients who had asymptomatic gold stones before pregnancy but that doesn't mean you have to uh, do a cholecystectomy for asymptomatic gold stones if they are planning <laughs> to have a child uh, that argument doesn't have uh, value so uh, if they have mild symptoms, of course, the consensus are to manage conservatively if they have pain, sort of pain relief. Uh, even milder forms of cholecystitis managed with antibiotics. Having said that, if they do come with recurrent symptoms, if they need sort of recurrent admissions with biliary colleagues or acute cholecystitis, uh, and if they are not responding to res uh, conservative management, uh, uh, acute cholecystitis doesn't respond promptly for antibiotics uh, need surgery. Cholecystectomy has been successfully performed in all three trimesters of pregnancy, but uh, safest is the second trimester. And uh, the main risk is not for the mother, but for the fetus uh, or the baby. Uh, so uh, should not be taken lightly. If you do perform, you have to take uh, extra precautions. But uh, if there are severe complications of the gold stones and uh, failure for the medical management or the recurrent problem, those are definite indications for cholecystectomy. And this can be done in all three trimesters, but best avoid in the first trimester. Then the CBD stones, we, we did touch the about the management of the CBD stones. It is absolute indication for a, a cholecystectomy as well, but before doing cholecystectomy, we have to make sure the CBD is clear of stones. This can be achieved with very minimal invasive modalities nowadays. We don't explore common bile duct uh, routinely nowadays. So CBD is cleared more than 95% of the patients with minimally invasive ERCPs. So we have other modalities like stone extraction, we can use laser, uh, lithotripsy, mechanical, uh, as well as uh, laser lithotripsy. Uh, so all these maneuvers will help us to sort of clear uh, CBD uh, before cholecystectomy or at the time of the cholecystectomy. So the management of uh, complicated cold stone disease like acute cholecystitis uh, uh, this, uh, uh, there are little arguments of the management of acute cholecystitis whether to manage uh, uh, medically or surgically but consensus nowadays is sort of good old days when we were medical students we were told acute appendicitis the management of choice is surgery acute cholecystitis is medical management it is not so nowadays. Acute cholecystitis, we offer early surgery because uh, to uh, because these patients, if you start, uh, you manage them medically, they have to stay hospital for a longer time. They may need repeated admissions. They may end up in complications which need sort of a major surgery as well. So nowadays, patients present to a hospital early. So uh, the window period is uh, very vague. Earlier it was sort of 40 to 48 to 72 hours, but nowadays even up to one week you, you may perform cholecystectomy for acute cholecystitis. Acute pancreatitis, if you detect cold stones, right, you should uh, offer cholecystectomy for these patients. Empyema and the mucosal of the gallbladder, the cholecystectomy, uh, initial cholecystectomy may be very difficult. so. Decompression is the preferred choice uh, before cholecystectomy uh, to tide up the acute situation in the majority of the patients. One thing which I haven't mentioned here is, is there a gold stone dissolvent therapy? Most of the patients come and ask whether 
there is a medicine to dissolve gold stones. Uh, there is no medicine to dissolve uh, renal stones uh, and gold stones is no different, but there are uh, few medicine to dissolve gold stones. Uh, these are uh, also DFC folic acid preparations, uh, but the clinical uh, success of these preparations are very poor. One thing is this is applicable, this can be given only for cholesterol stones and can be given only for small stones and it takes longer time to dissolve stones. Uh, so, and uh, the, uh, so when you stop these drugs, the chances of recurrence is also high. So it is not everlasting solution, it is not very effective solution and it is it is not a predictable solution also. We don't know which patient is going to uh, cure with this thing. There is no way we can assess whether he's having a cholesterol stones or pigment stones before starting this thing. And uh, the cost and all these things are against uh, uh, using this dissolvent treatment as a first line treatment. So if at all it has any place when there is when there is a patient where we are helpless, we don't, he is not a suitable candidate for any form of surgical intervention, right? So for those patients, uh, while salt dissolvent therapy, combined with probably ex extracorporeal shockwave dithotripsy to uh, crush or shatter these stones are also done. So these are uh, used in very remote situations, but not the first line medications. Uh, for the gold stone disease. Uh, I may conclude from that, should there be any questions, uh, you are more than uh, welcome uh, to ask questions. But if a patient with asymptomatic gold stone insists on surgery, right, this happens, uh, uh, I didn't mention this, uh, now there are, uh, there are certain employment requirements, especially sailors. So uh, there is a zero stone policy when you are recruit a sailor, uh, usually in the shipping uh, uh, industry. Uh, so they do come and sort of insist in surgery. Of course, years. Uh, uh, so uh, now if he lose his job, sort of he may die of starvation. So, of course, he has uh, offer surgery if there is a, a valid uh, uh, reason uh, for him to have surgery. But if he says sort of, uh, I am scared of developing a cancer, or I don't like to keep stone, uh, or I want to get pregnant, and I, uh, I'm wonder, I wonder whether I may develop symptoms during pregnancy. Those are not valid reasons uh, to go ahead with cholecystectomy. Uh, certain uh, employment requirements, yes, I agree. If you think the possibility of the CBD stone intraoperative in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, what are the precautions we should take uh, for post-op ERCP? Right. If you think there is a possibility of CBD stone during a uh, lab coli, uh, what precautions we should take uh, for the post-op ERC? Uh, the question is not that clear, so what should we do sort of during surgery? One thing is, uh, uh, now good old days, if you suspect of a stone uh, in the common bile duct, uh, we used to do good old days. Uh, if you suspect of stones uh, in the common bile duct during surgery, we do, used to do uh, cholangiography. Uh, nowadays, we don't do cholangiography because uh, uh, we don't do routinely cholangiography. Uh, but you, you uh, that is one option uh, to confirm that there, whether there is a uh, uh, stone in the common bile duct or not. And if there is a stone in the common bile duct, CBD exploration is not the form of treatment nowadays. We arrange uh, uh, ERCP and stone extraction as early as possible. This can be done in the same setting. Now, once you do the cholecystectomy, if you are, or the surgeon who is capable of doing a ERCP can 
uh, remove the stone once it is confirmed uh, with cholangiography at the same setting. If you don't have the facility to do cholangiography, then what you have to do is sort of you should not take ERCP very lightly. We should arrange a CT or a CT MRCP after surgery and arrange ERCP and stone extraction as soon as possible. And until then, if you are if you are not removing the stone at the same setting, the cystic duct. Now I said sort of once the gallbladder is removed, the intra uh, uh, the intrabiliary pressure goes up when there is an obstruction because as long as the gallbladder is there, the brunt of the pressure is taken up by the gallbladder. So what you should do is uh, we should uh, uh, very securely control the cystic duct. I would rather prefer to apply a hemolock clip rather than a metal clip or additional suture ligation of the uh, cystic duct uh, to uh, uh, to have a secure cystic duct. Whether to place a drain or not, uh, usually we don't have to sort of place a drain uh, anticipating a cystic duct blowout. Even if there is a cystic duct blowout, what you should do is to do a uh, ERCP and stent it. Then the second question is, uh, what is the current consensus in timing of surgery after cholecystitis? Uh, current consensus uh, are sort of within first week, uh, you can offer cholecystectomy. Uh, and uh, some uh, even sort of extend it beyond that, but uh, the, the consensus are sort of cholecystectomy within first week. But most of the pa uh, surgeons are comfortable of doing surgery within the first 72 hours. So earlier the better, you can do uh, until uh, first week, but preferably be within first 72 hours. But is the best time period after ERCP to do cholecystectomy? The, uh, if, he, if you do ERCP and patient develop pancreatitis, of course, you may not do cholecystectomy, but if not, the earlier as uh, earlier the better. Uh, is it is it an indication for surgery? What? Uh, Ganga. Is it an indication for surgery? What is? Uh, dyspepsia with uh, ultrasound gold stones. No other cause for dyspepsia. Uh, yeah, uh, this is not an indication for uh, cholecystectomy. You should have specific symptoms related to gold stones. Uh, you know, probably you are referring to uh, this famous charcoal stride. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, now cholecystitis, diverticulitis, and esophagitis, these two coexist. Uh, it used to, but uh, nowadays we consider these two as three different entities. So just mere dyspeptic symptoms, we don't do uh, cholecystectomy. Right. Uh, go down. One. Uh, what is meant by decompression of the mucosal empyema before surgery? Right. Uh, this can be decompress decompression means sort of a placing a tube into the gallbladder uh, and uh, drain it out. This can be done with ultrasound guidance through the liver, that is called the transhepatic. Uh, so uh, there is no spillage into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, or you can uh, even if you attempted laparoscopic procedure, you can do during that uh, procedure without, uh, uh, you may find it difficult to sort of dissect in the callus triangle, so you may place a tube into the gallbladder. Uh, uh, so if you detect it before surgery, the transhepatic route is uh, more uh, advised, but if you detect it during surgery, probably you may place a tube through the uh, peritoneal cavity. Uh, 
what the timing of cholecystectomy after an attack of goldstone pancreatitis, right? Uh, so goldstone pancreatitis, if you detect goldstone uh, uh, during the attack of the pancreatitis, you do it as soon as possible because he may develop another bout with the escape of another stone. So uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, so you have to sort of uh, uh, get rid of the culprit as soon as possible. What is the role of cholidocoscopy through cystic duct stump intraoperatively to remove uh, bile duct stone? Right. Uh, cholidocoscopy and uh, 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 transistic CBD exploration, uh, these were uh, in fact uh, 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 suggested uh, about 10-15 years ago uh, came into market and uh, 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 through the cholidocoscope people try to sort of push stones down and retrieve stones as well. And uh, this was successful only in limited number of patients, minority of the patients who are having small stones. So the majority were not benefited with these stones. And some used to use glucagon as well to dilate the sphincterotide uh, and uh, push it to the duodenum as well. Uh, with uh, uh, safer ERCP facilities, the, uh, the place for a cholidocoscopy transistic exploration of the common bile duct is not a routine procedure nowadays. Even the intraoperative cholangiography is not a routine procedure nowadays. But in some countries, some medical uh, surgical councils advocate to do routine uh, intraoperative cholangiography during uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So how to manage uh, post cholecystectomy syndrome? Uh, post cholecystectomy syndrome is, uh, yeah, uh, this was sort of very common thing which we were taught during our me medical student days. And uh, those days we thought it was due to a long cystic duct. Uh, so the, uh, to avoid uh, post cholecystectomy syndrome, it was advised to ligate the cystic duct flushed with the common bile duct those days. Uh, but we don't advise this thing now. We don't ask you to sort of explore uh, the cystic duct right down to the common bile duct. That causes more incidences of common bile duct injury, so it should not be done. So now we know the, uh, the reason for this post cholecystectomy syndrome is not the redundant cystic duct, but mainly the biliary dyskinesia. So this can be proven uh, by doing the biliary manometry. Uh, we don't have that facility, but sort of, if you want, we can do it. So uh, if they have troublesome uh, post cholecystectomy syndrome, we have to make sure it, whether it is due to uh, something related to biliary dyskinesia, this can be done, uh, uh, proved by maniometry or some other problem like uh, they may have chronic pancreatitis, dyspeptic symptoms uh, or uh, retained stone. So you have to do imaging to sort of rule this out and if it is due to uh, uh, biliary dyskinesia, the sphincterotomy will relieve their symptoms. So does intraoperative cholangiogram prevent CBD injury? Uh, people thought that intraoperative cholangiography is going to reduce CBD injury, but uh, the studies, uh, there were some studies shown that sort of it reduces CBD injury because this is a very operative dependent technique. But the Cochrane uh, analysis of what um, uh, the, the, uh, this, uh, on the pool data, uh, they shown that sort of it doesn't reduce intraoperative, uh, sorry, uh, CBD injuries because when you do a cholangiography, you uh, you open into the cystic duct, right? Which you think the cystic duct. Right? So if it is not the cystic duct and CBD, you do damage the CBD. 
so it doesn't <coughs> in the majority uh, so uh, but when you do the cholangiogram you know for sure that you have o opened into the common bile duct and that damage is very small and the control damage so so you do detect it early and damage is small and you can repair and you can do something early now if you can't do anything you can place a tube and come out right so it is not an undetected damage so because of these three reasons intraoperative cholangiography the outcome of cbd damage if it even if it happens is very much better than un unrecognized incidental cbd damage uh, so that is why the people who promote intraoperative cholangiogram do re uh, recommend it to be done uh, because though it doesn't reduce the CBD injury, the injury is detected early, injury is a controlled injury, injury is small, so the outcome is better. Any food restrictions for asymptomatic gold stones? Uh, mm. answer uh, I don't know uh, uh, but uh, you know in some centers for lithogenic bile if they suspect of having lithogenic bile they they recommend them to have also acid uh, uh, prophylactically uh, but this has not been shown uh, now the idea of uh, having low fat diet or anything like that is to sort of reduce symptoms incidence of symptoms so uh, i to date sort of i i haven't found a, a study which shown that dietary restrictions or sort of being on a low fat diet reduces the incidence of uh, symptoms in asymptomatic gold stones uh, frankly i haven't found uh, but uh, those diet is healthy diet so it's, uh, it's nothing you lose by having that kind of a diet. Uh, uh, so the correct answer I don't know. Uh, but I also do recommend low fat diet for these patients uh, uh, because you don't lose anything. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Then we'll wind up. Uh,